comfortably zoned with the zigzag man in Alameda, California, pushing on the doors of life marked pull and fighting the unholy trinity as we go. Big business, organized religion, and government. I am back, and you are flying high with me, the zigzag man, over the zone in Alameda, California, Northern California, right across the bay from San Francisco, and today I get to talk baseball, hot stove league, if you will. Um, My guest is a correspondent for the Major League Baseball Network. He is a co-host of Fast Pitch which is uh, basically what this is, podcast radio, only uh, on a big, big, big network. Um, It's ESPN, and he is Eric Lenneberg. How are you, sir? I'm great, Ralph, and thank you for having me. I listen to your show all the time. I love it, and I'm honored to be here. Oh, vice versa. um, Whether you know it or not, and I'm sure you don't, um, we have about – six or seven different shows, baseball shows, where um, co-hosts interact with each other. And that in itself is an art. You do it so well with your co-host. And um, I'm in awe of you. So uh, I talk about um, what you do. And if uh, you guys can do it, we try to emulate it. uncomfortably zoned and um so the, this well, thank is you. nice yeah um how'd you get started in this uh, what was your was baseball your passion was radio itself your passion um journalism how did it all you know from when you were a kid? well really really all three uh i've loved baseball since i was a little kid uh i was about four years old the first time I was taken to a Major League Baseball game at Dodger Stadium, and Sandy Koufax was pitching. So I grew up a Dodger fan and uh, just loved baseball. I played in high school and college, and uh, I became a journalist, actually. I was a newspaper reporter for about six years, so I do have a passion for journalism. And radio is something I've always loved. Okay. Uh, so you bring all three things to um, to the table. What did you grow up listening to on the radio? You were, oh, uh, I'm sure it was sports related, and you had Vinny. So, may I say, may I ask no more? Um, yes, I had Vinny. I listened to Vinny every night uh, again from the time I was a kid, all the way up until recently when he retired. Right. Um, sad to see him go, but nice to see him honored as he well deserves. Uh, he got the presidential award, some award from the White House where um, he was there the other day. I don't remember what the award was. I'm, I'm sure um, I should know it. But uh, great man, and he goes back to the New York days. I grew up basically uh, taken to a baseball game when I was four by my grandfather at the Polo Grounds, and uh, I became a Giant fan. Um uh, Jim Hearn didn't get to take Rosh Hashanah off or Yom Kippur, but I watched him pitch the first <laughs> the first wow. uh, first game. Yeah, and uh, that goes back to 1951, and um, so we have a lot in common from that standpoint. I I listened um, mostly to Red, even though I was a Giant fan. I listened to mostly Red Barber. And uh, Vinny worked uh, for, uh, with the Dodgers in Brooklyn under Red Barber's tutelage when he first started. So uh, That's right. He was Red's protege. Right. And um, there's a line. And that's the one nice thing about baseball. Whatever you talk about, you can trace back and sideways and forward <laughs> and over and out and inside <laughs> out. And you can come up with any sort of line that goes in – in crazy directions that make uh, our little microcosm of the world a real pleasure to to be involved with. Um, so you go through, you, you're out of college, you don't, um, you, your career as a, as a ball player 
comes to an end at, the, at that point? Um, came to an end. I played a couple of years in an independent league, but, uh, yeah, I was done at that point. Okay. And um, did you realize uh, that there was going to be that transition all along? I mean, were you able to scout your abilities um, and know that you got to have something else going? Um Along the you know, way. I wasn't uh, I wasn't really prepared for anything else. Um, I did have a uh, I loved journalism and I enjoyed it, so I got a job uh, with a paper in New York, the Daily News, was my first job. And, uh, really? Wow! Came back what a to way Arizona. To break in. Yeah, what I a way to break in at the time. I really didn't realize. I thought everybody started out that way, but uh, I moved out back to Arizona where I grew up and worked for the newspaper here, and then I got into a different profession entirely, and it was many years before I got to work in baseball. So uh, it was there all along, uh, my passion for the game, and must have been about 20 years ago, I was able to get a job announcing in the Arizona Fall League, and I've been doing it ever since. Nice. And that, for those people out there that um, don't know, the Arizona Fall League is really a gateway to the majors for a lot of players and a lot of managers. Dusty Baker managed there early on, um, among others. Hi. Bruce Bochy, Bob Melvin. Yes, yes. Um, and what a thrill that has to be because you are literally seeing the best prospects and this is after the season is over so you have you get to have an extended life a little bit with baseball that's you right get to see the, the best prospects while while i'm jonesing it, it day and night <laughs> um you get you get and you're in the warm arizona sun we get it's a little chilly in northern california um like I'm complaining, people around the country are freezing their asses off. It's 66 here, and I'm going, well, it's a little chilly. Um, yeah, but you get to see great ball. You get to see the best prospects of every organization come together. And um, so i got to ask you then, there's one prospect. I'm a big Mets guy. Um, Tim Tebow, has he shown anything? Yes, no, maybe. Uh, not Tremendously, and I saw him play several times this past fall league. Uh, he needs to learn how to hit the curveball. That's the best I can say. Okay. Uh, he's got a great arm. Other than that, I, I could remember, uh, you know me, Al, or uh, Ring Lardner. Well, they're throwing, the, try, <laughs> throwing curveballs. I'll be home soon. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's, right? That's right. Um but uh, so I looked at that as kind of a, a publicity thing, if you will. Uh, I think right. I thought he was there to sell tickets. Right. Uh, if not sell tickets, yeah, that's something I didn't think about. I just thought about publicity for the Mets' sake. But yes, to sell a few tickets. Wow. Um, it's a business. He played role. for the. He played for the Scottsdale Scorpions, and they drew about three times their normal attendance this fall with him out there. Okay. That uh, tells you something, it really. Um, reminded me of Michael Jordan playing baseball. In, in That's the right. Um, don't know. you got to give him a chance on some level of track to run on, and um, I we'll see what happens. Let's, let's put it that way. But he drew some people in. Maybe maybe they had a good time, too, you know, him yeah. notwithstanding. And anything that promotes the game from that standpoint really can't be all that bad. And, you know, when That's right. about rocket science here, or, you know, this isn't the most important thing in the world to some people, I guess. <laughs> I mean, uh, That's right. I well, <laughs> I wouldn't know personally. But I'm sure there are people that uh, could give a rat's ass, if the truth be known. <laughs> I guess so, but nobody in my life is that way. Right. <laughs> no, uh, nobody even knows what that means. <laughs> can, can conceive of it. You had an interesting 
um, I, I looked through your fa- Facebook page, and I even copied it. An interesting T-shirt up up there. It says, "Baseball is the center of the universe," or something to to that That's effect. Right. And, and it is on a lot of different levels. Um, Let me go back to the Arizona Fall League for a second. Uh, yeah, please, please. Usually, usually every year, the rookies of the year in both leagues were in the Arizona Fall League the previous fall. Uh, for instance, in 2011, Bryce Harper and Mike Trout played in the same outfield in Scottsdale. But uh, I want to mention back in the year 2000, uh, my co-host, M.C. Brown, and I were working in the booth in the Arizona Fall League, and there was a guy who came through. We'd never heard of him. His last name was Pujols and had no idea. Most people had no idea who he was, and he was phenomenal in the Fall League. And, of course, we're talking about Albert Pujols. He came up with the Cardinals and won the third base job that year. It was a rookie of the year. Put up some great numbers. If I'm memory serves, he has the record still for home runs and RBIs for our rookie. But that's an example of what you see in the fall league. Surprises, and you never know who's going to who's going to stand out. It's um, there's an adage in baseball: never fall in love in September or April or March, really. And, uh, yes. But this is different. This is it's neither of those two. Major league scouts, major league uh, player development, they get a lot from this. Where to place these guys at what level when they come at come out of uh, fall league? Minimum double A. Um, right. Double A seems to be the league that gets mo- that gets most of the attention in terms of the biggest prospects. Um, come out of double A, whereas triple A yes. is kind of the tweeners a lot. Am I right about that? That's a, You're absolutely right about that. A lot of focus on double A. A lot of the top okay. prospects are in double A. Um, you've got pipes, by the way. Um, oh, thank uh, have, you. Yeah, so do you, uh, how does the industry work? Do you audition, say you wanted to be a major league announcer someday. Do you go to... And I do. And you do. Um, do you send out a di- audition tapes? Do you... Um, uh, tapes? You're, do you do some announcing still at, in the Arizona Fall League? And I did this year. For, I did this year for the first time in a long time. I announced a few Arizona Fall League games. But um, I will hear about different openings and different guys leaving announcing positions, so I'll audition for those. I'll send an audition CD. Sometimes I know the uh, media relations people, so I'll get an audition. And I've done a few of those this off season, so I'm hoping to hear something soon. Right. Okay. Um, just want to know how it's going because um, there are some guys that you, you talk, you, it's interesting to hear. You have an interesting voice. It, it, a rhythm to it and a, a pacing and there's a uh, a smile on your voice. So, well, thank you. It's not something I ever worked on. It's just it's how I talk. Well, good. Well, that's the way it should be. <laughs> if it's if you have to work on it, there's no chance. It's a, that's it's true. Like comedy, if you're funny, you're funny. It's pretty. That's if right. you think funny, you're funny. It's you know you can go to class for it, but good luck with that. Yeah. Um, when you went to baseball games as a kid, how did you mm-hmm. look at the game? Who was who? Did, was somebody there to teach you, um, your father, grandfather, someone that um, explained things to you? Uh, how was that? What Was it a ritual yes. that you go to so many games? Because something had to fuel the fire of passion from an early yes. age. We, had, uh, we lived in – I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, but in the summers we would spend that in Southern California with our family. And my oldest brother was 17 years older than me. And he's the one that used to take me to Dodger Stadium, <clears throat> excuse me, and he would point out what's going on on the field. And I remember the many times we saw Koufax pitch, he would say, now remember, watch this guy. You're never going to see anything like it. You're going to tell your kids that you saw him pitch. And at the time, that meant nothing to me, but it was true. I did tell my kids that. But he would point out the game and the strategies of things uh, when I was very young, so I picked up on it pretty early. And I loved the game, so I started playing when I was about eight years old. 
Okay. And was there anybody that influenced you as a kid in terms of coaching that you, you learned from? And who were some of your teammates that went on or should have gone on? Uh, I had some great teammates. In high school, I played with a guy named Terry Kennedy, who taught okay. in the major leagues for 15 years. He was a teammate. Uh, His dad was a manager for a lot of years. and uh, That's right, and played himself. In fact, uh, his dad, Bob Kennedy, and Terry are the only father and son to ever home run, hit home runs in the World Series. Um, really? Didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, That's, but he was uh, the best player I ever played with. Oh, he was terrific. He played some years with the Giants, if I remember, out here. Um, he did. He was on the team that went to the World Series in 1989. And lost to the A's. Against the Angels. If I'm, uh, oh, no, Oakland, that, Oakland that, that was 89, different, different World Yeah, that was series. the Earthquake Series, everyone called it. Yes, the Earth, absolutely, where they lost four. Um, wow, that was a traumatic series. What great A's teams in those years, um, the drug thing, Conseco McGuire and all that notwithstanding, Oh, they had Kenny Henderson and Dave Stewart. And, um, That's right. And a good friend of mine, Bob Welch, pitched for the A's. He won the Cy Young Award yes. in 1990. I knew Bob for rest, 30 years. Rest in great individual. Home dog yes. pitcher. Um, yeah. That's uh, tragic. He died very, yes. much too young. Yes. Um, how did you get to know Bob Welch? I met Bob. This was back when I was a journalist. Uh, he was... I covered the 1980 All-Star Game, and Bob made the team that year, and I interviewed him. And we got to talking, and we had a lot of things in common, so stayed in touch over the years. He later moved to Arizona, and he managed an independent league team and had my son as his bat boy. My son was 12 or 13 at the time. And we just stayed in touch. Bob was a guy you could call and say, hey, let's go grab some coffee and talk about things. Just a great guy, a great friend. Yeah. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for everybody's loss. And, for everybody's uh, loss, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's too bad. Those were some um, some teams that um, that Tony La Russa managed. That's and right. there's a whole thing with Tony La Russa. I mean, his entire career, the ups and downs um, of Tony – he uh, spends a lot of time in Arizona. He was with the uh, Arizona, just uh, just left the Arizona um, team. Yeah, the Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks, absolutely. Um, what can you tell me about him? He's a very misunderstood person, the way I see things. I think so, too. He's a very private person. You're not going to talk to Tony and get to learn very much. And he'll talk about the game, but not anything about his personal life. But I think he's a lot more intelligent than people give him credit for. Well, he's an attorney. Uh, That's right. Um, I don't know, good, bad, or indifferent what, what you think of attorneys. There are good attorneys, <laughs> bad attorneys. Um, but this one happens to be a, a Floridian. And there was some, over the years, there's been uh, some mention of the fact and um, – Ozzy Smith was a, a great example. He didn't think Ozzy didn't think he was treated all that well with Tony, and uh, he thinks that it might have had something to do with race. Really, that well, that's the first I've heard about that. But uh, it could be true. I, I would think Ozzy is a very, uh, very honest guy. I don't think he would come up with that out of the blue. Yeah, I seem to remember that. And if I'm wrong about that hints and allegations, that sort of thing. But um, I don't know. I do know that he sat in the clubhouse with uh, the Bash brothers, and I think he probably knew something was going down um, drug-wise. Over, over I'm the quite course. sure. I think he, if, if anybody is the godfather of enablers in all of that, and you have to blame everybody in baseball from top to bottom. From top to bottom, journalist. including the commissioner's office. Exactly. Most definitely, in, including the, the commissioner's office. He wasn't going to deal with it until the bottom fell out. And because right. the owners were making money, 
and um, that was the name of the game and probably still is. Uh, I'm going to ask you this objectively. How much of it continues? I think very little, but I believe it does continue. Um, players are getting caught, and I would think for everyone who uh, tests positive and is suspended, there's probably three or four guys who don't get caught. I think. I could be wrong about that, but that's my impression. All right. Um, what do you think will stop it eventually? Do, do players have to die from the ill effects of it? You know, it's a st- steroidal thing. Anything that's steroidal breaks down the body eventually. I mean, you, your um, every part of it, your kidneys, your liver, it, it affects things. Um Tumors, I'm thinking Lyle Alzado. Lyle Alzado, that's right. Right. Uh, you know, um, the steroid era was so recent in memory as far as baseball goes, but a lot of those players are starting to get older and hit middle age, and I believe some of them will start to show some of these signs, and maybe that will be a big factor. Some of the younger players will see that and go, gee, I, you know, I want to have life after baseball and not be dealing with all of these physical issues that come from steroid use. Now, you came up playing high school and college. Is it an issue in, um, and when I say this, uh, I'm going to say amateur, and I put that in quotes because you may agree with me or not, but I think that um, college baseball especially is semi-pro. It's not amateur. Um, I agree. Okay. Is is there or were there when you were coming up, and I know the approximate t- time you were just from the players you played with, and um, was it at that level too, or is it just at the pro level? It was totally unheard of at any level back when I played. Uh, okay. It just wasn't an issue. Okay. There were other, other drugs that people were concerned. You know, a lot of cocaine use back in the 80s. Uh, yeah, and greenies and what have you, and it was absolutely. And amphetamines were the biggest issue. And, right. They don't and, change and, the chemical makeup of your body, though. It's no, different. No, they don't. It's a different animal, and uh, sometimes people try to say, "Well, there were always drugs, or always this, that, and the other thing." Well, you know, this is different. It's a you know human growth hormones, that sort of thing. Um, that's a different and, animal and again, altogether. How much should be legislated when you think about it? Um, who's doing the legislating? And when there are issues, is it Congress that has to light a fire? I think it was Congress that let, lit a fire under Major League Baseball, or Bugsy yes, Lee came never would have acknowledged it. That's true. Uh, it came to that Congress having hearings, and then it all came apart as far as the steroid era and players using so blatantly. But does Congress have to get involved now? I don't know. At the amateur level, I know for a while there, there were high school players using steroids and having really serious effects because, you know, they're teenagers. They're still growing. And to put that kind of chemical in their system can wreak havoc on them emotionally as well as physically. At any age, the uh, roid rage, it goes, um, it runs prevalent in the, police departments all over the country, and um, I contend that it's roid rage itself that's responsible for a lot of these shootings and the, the craziness that goes on, because the drug is not just physical, it has definitely has a mental effect, and um, that's going to play havoc with the clubhouse as well. That's uh, right, that's right. So, we had a guest on our show, and you've had him also, Jim Campanis, Jr. I uh, have. Wrote his book. You do yeah. listen. You do listen. Eric, I am honored. Um, Absolutely. Do, um, woo! That, Jim Campanis, Jr., what an interview, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is, he's, he wrote a book very recently with his dad. Um, Born talking baseball, about baseball, that's right. Yeah, the three, the lineage of um, Al Campanis, who was a, a scout with the Dodgers way back, way back when, with Jackie Robinson coming That's up. Right. He was an assistant with O'Malley, um, or I'm sorry, Branch Rickey before um, the, 
Yeah, before um, O'Malley fired Ricky. Uh, but That's um, right. And Al later became yeah. general manager of the Dodgers. But what, yeah, great book. And Jim is also a good friend of mine. And uh, I know he discussed in his book the use of steroids and how he could see it as a player. He could see the roid rage and the crazy behavior out of some of his teammates. And also some strange injuries that, that happened. And it was obvious it had to be steroid uses that had these injuries. Uh, well, I, I cite McGuire and his bulk, I think, contributed to the the – um, cartilages, ligaments going out in his feet. He had horrible feet injury. He's carrying, this is a kid that I saw uh, when he was with Modesto, right out, right out of the Olympics. He was 6'3", 6'4", weighed 180 pounds. Yes. <laughs> he, and he bulked up to the point where it was just, um, I don't think, it, I don't think the rest of your body you know, you could build up your muscles, but you can't build up collagen ligaments. And That's right. And I think that, that was responsible for a lot of his injuries. I don't think, just as an aside, that he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Steroids or not, I don't think his career justifies being in the Hall of Fame. His, it certainly was inconsistent. Right. And, uh, again, and hit by injuries, and which came first, they say steroids helps cure injuries or not cure the injury, but helps in recovery time. So you're giving it They say that, but I also think it masks some injuries, and you play through it and, and have to deal with the injury later. That's what I think. Right. I think pain is an indicator. It probably masks the pain, and pain is an indicator of um, you shouldn't really, you know, if you're in pain, maybe you shouldn't be throwing um, or playing, right. you know, it could be telling you something after all, huh? Uh, you know, you've speaking been of, terrific. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, speaking of throwing. More, please, please. To, I wanted to get your you... take on, uh, yeah, I wanted to get your take on pitch counts because it's something that we've been outspoken about it on our show. I've had guests, for instance, uh, we had Eli Gerba, uh, the former Yankee and Angel pitcher, and Eli was. We've had him on our, our network. He wouldn't talk to me, but he'll talk uh, to one of, one of the other shows. And um, he, Eli, I have some memories with him from the old days. Um, the pitch, I don't oh. think it's so much the pitch count. I think it's the number of days. If you're throwing that hard, and these players are, they need more than five days, four days rest. They need an extra day. And. That would do it, and that's not my idea. That's Marty Rose's idea, uh, yeah. one of my my co-hosts. He said, you just have to – this kid's been throwing since they're 15, 16 years old. They're on road road leagues. They're going out for the AAU, and they're traveling. No arm is meant to have that many pitches in it. It's it's craziness. Got to well, but you think back to the days of Koufax and Marichal, uh, there was no pitch down. They completed their games. And I mentioned Eli because he had told me that when he was pitching for the Angels, he might be 100 pitches deep in the fifth inning. But if the manager ever came out to pull him, there would have been an argument about it. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. There was a game, a 16-inning game, Juan Marichal and Warren Spahn. They both threw over 260 pitches. They pitched the whole 16-inning game and went back for their next start four days later. So I, well, I contend that he, as great as they were in that in that game, and there was a book written about that game, it's a historic game, that neither of them threw more than five pitches over ninety that game. Okay, yeah, that's possible. That's probably yeah, that's probable. Uh, okay, but still. So that the uh, strain of throwing as hard to throw ninety eight miles an hour, if you once hit ninety eight miles an hour in the old days, that kind of thing. Um, the strain of throwing as hard, whereas you can groove along at throwing at 91 miles an hour. They had deception, and those two pitchers especially had the deception in their favor. Didn't have to throw 98, because the difference between 91 and the 70 that they threw their off-speed pitches was able to get batters out. 
And that's right. And they all those two had in common that they had more than two pitches. They had three, maybe five, like in Marischal's case, from different delivery points and different uh, angles and different grips on the ball. It was an art to throw. It wasn't just, you know. Uh, That's right. I was going to mention that, that Marischal and Spahn in particular had different delivery points, and you never knew where the ball was coming from. Right. <clears throat> so you didn't have to throw incredibly hard, although they had nice fastballs with movement. Fastballs today are just judged by speed. The radar gun will not tell you anything but the the pure speed. And a major league hitter, minor league hitter, throw it in at ninety five. I'll hit it back at ninety eight. I hit it back at That's you. That's right. At ninety eight. If, if it has if no I movement, don't it comes what's straight coming. The string. Yeah. Right, and they used to call it pulling the string. You said pulling the string. Um, and. It, pitching is the art of deception, the way I look at it. Um, I think scouts, organizations, want the big pitcher, the, the guy who's six four, two hundred. You know, the cinder guards and the bum gardeners and, and these yeah. guys, are, you know, just good old country boys who can throw the shit out of the ball and just that's right. <laughs> um, and light up, and that's what America wants. They don't have the home run as much as they have, but they like that pitch. Oh, he broke 98 miles an hour. I'm yeah, and you've got uh, Rawlis Chapman coming in there at 103 every once in a while. People love that. Right, exactly. And that's um, whatever it is that motivates the fan, um, I guess they go for. Let's put it. Right. They'll, they'll see what works. They'll see what brings butts into the seats and uh, that's right but I never thought to I never thought of the Tebow thing that way and I, I go back to that just br- that's all they were doing is bringing bucks I thought they were getting publicity for the Mets yeah you know see how this guy is doing no it was you know fill up the stadiums that's a lot of money and it, in the Arizona League, they buy merchandise. They get they have a full array of caps and T-shirts. And That's right, and polo shirts, and everything you can think of. Everything you see in the Major League Stadium, they have there in the Fall League. Right, and they do in spring training as well now. That's become an industry. And, yes. Um, hey, uh, it's amazing that when I was a kid, I loved sports because it was on the back page and I didn't have to see about the Bay of Pigs on the front page or um, yeah. the, all that all that was going on in those days. You skate to the back page. Business, you weren't thinking about it in those terms. But as an adult, you come to realize that um, it's just as much of, of a business as Trump empires. That's right. Uh, um you know, it could be bigger than Trump empires. I know their union is. Their union is incredibly powerful. And, yes. And um, God rest Marvin Miller. Did you ever get yes. to interview him? I did not. Uh, he passed away before I had a chance, but he really is the one that started it all, and a lot of players today don't realize that. Right. Oh, yeah, the, um, the history of the game. Now the history, not just the players, you have to, they look back, the labor union. I learned something from Ralph Branca's passing, and I learned it from listening to an interview on Tony D'Angelo's show with Carl Erskine. I've had Carl on once or twice, but he had him on when Ralph passed, and he mentioned that Branca was instrumental, if not the founder and financier of BATS, which is the um, uh, baseball assistance program. Where That's they, right. I didn't realize that either. Yeah. Um, so rest in peace, Ralph Branca. It seems the older I get each week, we're losing um, – my boyhood heroes, and um, my grandmother was right. She said, "If you live long enough, is the, you know, you're going to be punished for it in one way or the other." That's right. She, family and um, musicians. We lost in one week. I got to tell you this. 
I lost Mose Allison, Leon Russell, and Leonard Cohen in the week before Thanksgiving. <laughs> just, that's a huge loss. Yeah, that, that's a huge loss, all three of those. For me, it was absolutely devastating. I mean, just um, very, very um, sad to see. And yes. mortality, you son of a gun, you win again this time. <laughs> but it's like hitting balls, hitting tennis balls off the wall. You know what yes. I'm saying? The yes. wall's going to be standing. <laughs> More, it's you're going to be, be there no matter the walls, what. <laughs> no matter what. And mortality, no matter what, is going to win. <laughs> no matter That's what. Right. <laughs> All right. You can so count with on. that in mind, uh, Eric, will you come back? Absolutely, Ralph. Love to. And oh, I'd love to have beautiful. you on our show, The Fast Pitch. Oh, wow. I'd be honored. That would be that would be terrific. And um, you just – we'll keep in touch. And I'll, I'll send you a link to this when I publish it. It'll be with it within the week. And uh, I thank you. I'm going to end the show the way I do every one. I won't end it when I'm on your show because um, it's Major League Baseball. But I will on this one. I'm going to implore you to keep your humor dry, keep your dreams wet, keep your kids out of military recruiting offices and your grandkids too, and off the laps of clerics that wear dresses just to be on the safe side. I love it. That's All a those, great way to finish. Right, am I right? Just, you You're don't right. have to do it. You don't have, they don't have to listen. They can listen to one. They can listen to all four. But, you know, it, it would behoove them. <laughs> Just, <yeah. laughs> we'll catch you next time. Thank you very, right. very much, Eric. You have a great day. Thank you, day. Ralph. You too. All Bye-bye. right. See you soon.